Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Mint Door. We are just thrilled with our next guest, Dr. Effie Habsha. Now, Dr. Habsha earned her um, Doctor of Dental Surgery Diploma in Prosthodontics and Master of Science degrees from the University of Toronto. She is an adjunct assistant professor at the Department of Dentistry and at the University of Rochester. Now, Dr. Habsha currently instructs at the graduate level in prosthodontics at the University of Toronto, but she is also the founder of Women in Dentistry Work-Life Balance. The Women in Dentistry is a group that was created in 2010, which aims to educate, empower and connect all women in the dental field. And Dr. Habsha maintains a private practice limited to prosthodontics in Toronto and lectures nationally and internationally on various prosthodon prosthodontic and surgical topics. So without further ado, we welcome you to the Mint Door podcast with our guest, Dr. Effie Habsha. All right, welcome to another episode of the Mint Door podcast. I'm Dr. Laura Schwinn. And I am Dr. Karen Tindall. And we are honored to have Dr. Effie Habsha on with us today, prosthodontist extraordinaire and founder of Women in Dentistry. Thank you, Dr. Habsha, for being with us on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. We're so excited um, to chat with you. And you had a simple idea yeah. way back about bringing women together in the dental field to network and share and learn. Mm -hmm. How did that lead on to the birth of women in dentistry? <laughs> That's mm -hmm. a very good question. And I find that um, my answer is a very honest and simple one. It really um, was a way for me initially to connect with my female referrals, to be quite honest, if I'm fully transparent, because I didn't realize the power of that connection that we as women made to one another. So it was, you know, I was one of the first prosthodontists in the city of Toronto to female prosthodontists to practice. And I thought, you know, why not hone in on my niche of being a female clinician and connect with potential female referrals. And it was with a lot of trepidation at first because all of my referrals, the majority of my referrals were male. So I just didn't want to isolate myself and potentially harm myself. But I thought, you know what, there's no harm in inviting a number of female referrals. Let's get together for an evening of education. I gave a lecture and we had maybe 30 or 40 women in our education center in the office. And um, the lecture was great, but beyond the lecture, the buzz the next day was just the, the feeling of that night of how it was great to connect with other women because the topics and the conversations that happened on the side while we were, you know, registering and eating dinner and socializing were all the things that we women uh, often face as challenges. And so that kind of, it was really the crowd and the movement that encouraged me to repeat the event. And so um, the first event was back in 2010, um, in the spring of 2010. And because of the really tremendous feedback, um, I changed the format to the following spring for our second annual symposium uh, to have other women come in and speak. And we had uh, a typical evening, and it was always in the evening, we had a typical um, uh, breakdown of two clinical talks and one non-clinical talk. And that's really been the foundation for our organization to cover, of course, the clinical side of dentistry, because you know that's important and, and we're, we offer CE. But beyond that, subjects that touch us as women clinicians and not only dentists also it you know branches out to our auxiliary team the, the people that we work with so mm -hmm. that was the birth of the um the organization and then fast forward 13 years we're we're all over the world i think um and certainly you know it allows me to meet people like you that we just have gotten to connect over um online and and it's just been a really wonderful collaboration and I can't wait to host you on our platform as well so <laughs> so awesome that's, that's how we started <laughs> I love that and it, it's it's been going for many years and we'll we'll get to talking about this up well not this year's but the upcoming year's symposium yeah. and what we can look forward to that for that but I love how you talked about balancing the 
the clinical with the non-clinical. And um, I just know, and I, and I appreciate that Women in Dentistry stands for more than just clinical excellence. And you have several other pillars. Can you talk about maybe some of those other pillars that are yeah. important to you and bringing that to light in Women in Dentistry? Yeah, I mean, for me, like I said, it was all in organic growth. So I sort of was able to read the room and see, I think I had a fairly good instinct as to what would resonate with with people simply because I'm a woman myself and, you know, I have a lot of colleagues and friends. And so um, the the pillars really, I mean, if the tagline that's evolved as it has been like to educate, empower and connect women in the dental field. And we've done that in so many ways and even in ways which I didn't realize would end up being, um, you know, actually some pillars of the group. So what I mean to say is, you know, I featured female speakers. So yes, they were evening speakers, uh, speaking um, events, but often the speakers that might've been their first time lecturing to a, you know, a, a modest audience, whether it's 30 to 50 people, because that's how many people we were able to contain in our office. And um, in 2018, I decided to take it out of my office because we had a waiting list of people wanting to attend the event and we were only able to occupy, like to allow 50 people. And so we took it to a, a venue and um, we had, uh, you know, my target number was 100. And, you know, I don't know if you remember the movie, The Field of Dreams, if, if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of threw out a number. I said, I want at least 100 people. And without, you know, without fail, we got 100 people registered. And in that audience were um, 13 corporate sponsors because it was just the interest was there. That that was right around the Me Too movement. So everything kind of related to women was woke. Um, and so we had our um, we had corporate sponsors. So my my long winded answer is that the speakers that presented at that event were essentially scouted by some of the companies and then they have gone on to you know have uh somewhat of a speaking career so even that you know unintentional thing that happened was really heartwarming for me because it allowed me like little old me to to mm -hmm. launch or to help accelerate potential speaking um, and so, and I'm finding that with our webinars as well, and I'll get to that in a minute, but when we've had speakers on our webinars, there are scouts that watch those webinars and uh, several people have gotten, you know, speaking gigs from that. So I think that's really tremendous. I think that's really rewarding for me because I know how hard it is to break into the speaker circuit. Cause I mean, I'm one of fairly few women that are often on the podium at, you know, um, uh, prosthetic conferences. And I had really great mentors to open the door for me, but a lot of people don't. And so mentorship is a huge pillar um, for speakers, which was unintentional. And then a very intentional uh, mentorship program was one that is uh, chaired by my dear friend, Tracy Hendler, who you have interviewed as well, um, mm -hmm. where we have a mentorship program that connects women clinicians to one another. So an inexperienced or newly graduated um, or dental students with, um, you know, people with five years plus experience. So I think mentorship is a huge pillar and it's really been uh, very rewarding to see that. Yeah. I mean, I'd love it if you could share with us like some of your journey of what led you into dentistry and yeah. then what led you down the road to be so passionate about teaching and mentoring. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, dentistry in general, I knew that I wanted to enter uh, to be in the health sciences. And it was, you know, toss up between medicine or dentistry. And I, I was kind of drawn towards dentistry because of the artistic side and because I, to be quite honest, I thought four years and I'm done. No residency like doctors, like I didn't want to hear that. I got into dental school and I was like just 20 or 21. I thought, okay, I'll be done by the time I'm 24 or 25. Little did I know that I'd go on to do my, you know, GPR residency and, and uh, specialty and so on and so forth, my master's degree, but that's kind of how I ended up in dentistry. And then again, um, just having, you know, uh, the, the luxury of, or the, 
the desire to learn while I was in dental school, I happened to um, attend a lecture by given by the professor George Zarb and, um, and I was just so um, in awe of his kind of intellect and I thought, wow, if I can work for him as a summer student, this was right after first year, um, mm. I'd be super happy. Uh, so I cornered him at the end of the lecture. I introduced myself and I asked him if he could uh, open, if he if he had any spaces available for a summer student. And I'm sure he just created a space for me because <laughs> he was very big into mentorship. And that really, um, his, his guy, I've had a few significant mentors in my life. My first one being my dad, who is um, his number one fan. And, and of course my mother, but George Zarb really, um, was you know instrumental in my career in prosthodontics and it just sort of evolved and he had the vision back then to recognize the need to showcase women as well because I remember him pulling into me into my office when I was a resident at that point I'd done my four years of dental school and then a year of residency and then I was in pros and uh, I had a half-time professorial position at the UFT and he said Effie we need more women like you on the clinic floor because quite frankly all we see is old white guys and that was so true back then. Now it's a lot more colorful, a lot more, um, a lot more uh, diverse, of course. Um, but he had that that foresight back then, and um, he was a real inspiration for me. And I kind of, I love to pay that forward in whichever way I can to potentially serve as a mentor. Not potentially. I I will own that. <laughs> I have mm -hmm. mentored a lot. This is what we women do. We kind of diminish ourselves. Like potentially, maybe no. Mm -hmm. I have, and I am a mentor to many, and I'm very proud of it. And it's not only me, it's me and my, you know, my amazing colleagues. So, um, so that's kind of how I ended up where I am. And then again, just, it just sort of evolved organically. And even, you know, teaching, I've always enjoyed teaching. I think I'm pretty good at it. I like to relate to the student because I remember what it was like to be a student. And I don't know if you guys remember, but you always remember the demonstrator, the prof that was just so mean to you. And I'm like, why? Like, there's no space for that. And so I bring, you know, love and care and um, obviously expertise to my students. And I think that they they feel that. So teaching has always been a huge part of what I do. I, I really enjoy it. And that also uh, trickles to like lecturing and speaking and teaching, you know, now on a, on a local national and international level, which has been very, very rewarding. Cause that's a different, that challenges a different part of your brain. So, you know, I, I always like to challenge myself. And so whether it's, you know, doing the international lectures, whether it's uh, adopting a new clinical technique, whether it's expanding women in dentistry, that's what makes me tick. It's not for everyone, but that's what I like to do. Mm -hmm. I, I love how you bring up the fact that, you know, we all remember those, those hard, terrible teachers and we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we also remember, yeah, remember, yeah, we also remember the good ones. Oh yeah. Like, oh, you yeah. know, they hold a special place in our heart. Hundred percent, and I have a funny story. Well, I'll let you ask your question. Or no, go yeah, ahead. Tell um, your funny story. No, go ahead. Well, it, you know the expression "karma." Karma will come back to get you. Or um, I remember when I was in dental school, and um, actually as a summer student, one of you know I was all of a first year dental student, and part of my responsibilities, what I I had the privilege of watching. Um, implant surgery being done by the staff at the implant prosthodontic unit is Toronto, which was the the pinnacle of implant dentistry. I mean, that, that's where it all started uh, in North America from the 1982 conference in Toronto. And so I was very blessed to be able to, to shadow essentially. And there was one doctor there that was the night, he was the nicest guy. And uh, his name is Peter Barrick and uh, periodontist, very skilled, but beyond his skill, his just his demeanor was just so lovely that he treated everyone equally. Mm -hmm. And he treated me as a, four, a first year dental student as well as he would treat, you know, Professor Zarb. And it just stuck. And I just remembered, you know, the, the way I felt around him, very appreciated and very valued. And contrast that with, you know, another one of the demonstrators back then that was just not a nice person. Well, wouldn't you know that fast forward a dozen or two, almost 20 years later, whatever, I'm an established prosthodontist and these guys are retiring and looking for a place to hang their hat or to join a practice, not retiring, but, you know, wanting to slow down. 
And both of those people kind of knocked on our doors and I had some opposition to the one that was mean because not, not as a payback, but if you're going to treat people like that, you're going to treat patients like that and staff like that. So Dr. Birick, I a hundred percent support and he joined our practice and he was with us, you know, for quite a few years until he just recently retired. And, and I remind him of that all the time. I said, Peter, you know, good for you because the impact you made on me, I just, I don't remember what you taught me. I don't remember the details. I don't remember the scalpel that you used, but I remember how you made me feel. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to impart to anyone I have contact with that, you know, I, I, I love to kind of nurture and to, you know, I'm not, not such a softy, but you know, I'm firm, but I'm, I'm very loving. And I, I, I think I, uh, that shows in my teaching style. So, and that's one of the comments that I've gotten that I'm pretty real, but that's me in general. I, I wear my heart on my sleeve <laughs> and I kind of, uh, I tell it like it is. So, yeah, but, you know, always be nice to people because you never know where you'll end up. And that's not the reason you should be, but I think that that's just a lesson that, you know, that's how you, one should live their life, to be honest. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that story, <laughs> I love it when people tell stories that it takes me back mm -hmm. and then it makes me think, oh, what was my story or what? And it just, I could just see that just played out and yeah. to the same to the to the to the guy who in oral surgery held my hand as I took my first tooth out right. like literally his hand was on my hand and we you took the tooth out that. together yeah. versus somebody else that I wish you'd have been my prosthodontic I, yeah. um, <laughs> person because I remember leaving that clinic in tears probably oh, more than once yeah. oh yeah and there's no reason like why make someone feel bad like yeah. I get the stupidest questions asked sometimes like questions that are just like whoa but I would never let that person feel that way I'm like you know that's a really interesting you know or whatever it is but I'm not condescending because yeah. at the end of the day they're there to learn right and so who better to teach them, you know? So <laughs> it's super important to, to, to be that way. I think that, that's just how I roll. Yeah. Well, and, and when you're touched by those people that um, treat you in a respectful, loving way, it opens the door for yeah. you to uh, entertain. Maybe that's how I want to be in life. Maybe that's sure. what I, maybe I'd like to teach. Like, you know, whereas if you get shut down, that could yeah. shut down somebody's potential. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, again, all about empowerment. And that's why I think our our um, mentorship program has touched so many people in such a positive way. And again, I have to give the shout out to, to Dr. Hedler um, and the team at University of Toronto, the, the, the girls who um, match mentors and mentees, because it's quite a large undertaking. But the feedback that we've got. And again, I didn't even realize what an impact it was until I read some of the testimonials from the mentors, from the mentees, but also from the mentors, because we're giving people an opportunity to give back. So many people graduate and they move out to wherever and are not close to university. They don't teach, they have no student interaction. And the amount of feedback I got from my mentors saying, thank you for giving me the opportunity to help mold or to shape someone. I mean, it's, it's just, amazing and it's just um and that's why we have a feature on our instagram like we occasionally post um testimonials for mentors and mentees and it's uh it's really great it's i think we're kind of really doing a positive things and we're we're quite impactful mm -hmm. yeah that's awesome well, i mean we we both are mentors for you amazing. and we love like it brings us so much pleasure to be able to do, do that. Testimonial? So. Oh my God. I would love to feature you guys and to do a testimonial. So because <laughs> yeah. so it brings us it brings us a lot of pleasure as well. well to be right? able to you can speak to that. that person. Because yeah. I mean it brought me back to something that you said about how you know when when you see people, I think Laura, you said it when people are nice and like you can be that's how I want to be. Yes. Yeah. And I have never understood the people in this world who are like, and it, it happens so much in dentistry and medicine and those professions. I had it really hard. Mm -hmm. So you have to as well. Yeah. Why, not, mindset, break, like, why not break that mindset? Yeah, right. It's crazy. So by doing something like this enables you to yeah. do it differently. A hundred percent. Yeah. So it is. Well, and that that just takes me right back to the beauty of women in dentistry and your vision for women in dentistry. Um, 
in changing that for the women. And so kudos to that. But maybe you could tell us a little bit um, more about how exactly all the different ways women in dentistry helps network and empower women, both in person and virtually. And, um, you know, I know you have an event coming up, so could, yeah. you could just touch on all those areas. We, you know, our pillars really is uh, women in dentistry work-life balance, which is the tagline as well. And ladies, believe me, I don't think work-life balance actually exists, but kind of, that's a whole other topic. But um, what what we do, you know, the offerings that we have right now are, um, number one, education, and education in live and virtual format. So uh, we have our annual symposium, which is year 13 um, in Toronto, April the 14th. That will be online soon, and I hope you ladies will be there and hopefully speak mm -hmm. there following year um but that's a really great event and we had our first full day event last year and we we knocked it out of the park um mm -hmm. with over 300 attendees and 45 corporate sponsors and uh an amazing speaker lineup from all over and it, and, it, and the idea is really i'm very we're very inclusive so we want the entire dental team to be there so there's content for our team members so my vision is to have this as an event for the entire female staff or the entire staff and men are invited as well they they can attend if they so choose there we don't discriminate um but uh the the idea was bring your office with you because it's a day where you have breakfast and lunch and snacks uh, served um but there's also educational content so for team members the afternoon the morning is geared toward the entire dental practice with clinical as well as non-clinical topics we have a really great psychologist coming in talking about women you know type of stuff that women um, uh, encounter and how to deal with, you know, various challenges, anxiety, stress, uh, um, so on and so forth. But uh, so that will appeal to the entire audience. And then in the afternoon, we have um, another separate uh, salon for team members. So we have something on aligner therapy and the patient experience or for the practice managers. So there's, and the hygienist, so there's something for everyone. So that's our big kind of flagship event. And then beyond that, we have some smaller uh, in-person events, but um, we do have webinars, which again, touch upon clinical and non-clinical talks. So we'll have people, you know, psychologists or communication experts or financial people come in and give a one hour webinar. Um, and then of course the clinical. And so, and again, all female speakers, that's my one requirement. I do want to have female speakers, but attendees, whoever wants to attend can attend because I think it's important to give female speakers a platform because we don't have a lot of it. And it, it's not necessarily deliberate. It's just that if you're a man organizing a Congress and all you know is other men, then that's who you'll gravitate towards. And I know that for a fact because I have organized Congresses and I've been involved in that conversation and I know more people now so I can have more women on the stage. Mm -hmm. So it's not about giving women the opportunity if they're not deserving. The quality, the caliber, the, the work has to be there. That goes without saying, but it's just that exposure. And then I believe that eventually, you know, the, the gender disparity that does exist will be um, non-existent. So we have live events. We have the symposium being the big one. We have webinars as well. They're all free so far. Uh, not the live event, but the symposium. And then we have a journal that we publish twice annually. Um, uh, again, with clinical and non-clinical topics. We've got a hygiene section, we've got a health and wellness, we've got a whole bunch of you know, really interesting content. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, our social media presence, and we're looking to open chapters across the world. And what that means is, you know, there's no kind of monetary gain from opening chapters. It's just spreading the, um, the, the movement and basically building a community. So we have a community in Tel Aviv, Israel. We have one in Montreal. We have one in Saudi Arabia. And they may not be that active, but they are. But the idea is that we all belong to this sort of, uh, you know, like-minded, we're all like-minded women or people that are belong to the same community. So mm -hmm. um, I would say the social media presence, online presence, live and virtual, and then just events throughout the world as they develop. And of course, the mentorship program, as I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. that's, that's amazing so, yeah. just think yeah. I, where it can, has come since those early days right and people sometimes still don't even get it I was just at a congress this week in in New York City and uh, I guess we got on the topic somehow and then a man said I don't get it 
what's the point? <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> you, know, you don't have to get it, but you know, and I just kind of went through, I enlightened him, let's just say. And I think he caught on afterwards. So, I mean, what people don't realize is that, you know, innately, like while the majority of dental students, certainly in North America, and I hear in Europe as well, are female graduates, still the the market is is predominantly male dentists, mm -hmm. um, but that'll eventually you know trickle trickle out or trickle down. So um, there already is by default men in dentistry because that's really the way of the world. If you go to to a symposium, you know, out of twelve speakers or the event that I attended this past weekend, there are, I think eighteen speakers. There's one woman on the podium. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not a criticism, but I think it's just an awareness. And so my program next year, we're going to have more, again, not because I want to check the box, but because I know of a lot of really great women that why not give them that that opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. So the faith of dentistry is slowly changing from the ground up. And again, I think it's just a, a gradual organic involvement or evolution and women like me like you like Anne Duffy from dues like you know leaders that kind of have spearheaded this and we're seeing a lot more women's groups developing and I think why not the more the merrier right so there's no scarcity mentality I, I think that you know collaboration between us is only beneficial and um and and I think it's a very exciting thing to to be a part of so that's why I keep doing it because that's pretty much the, the biggest gain. <laughs> well, and, and like you said, the organicness of yeah. how it developed and the fact that it was it organic. Wasn't it wasn't like, there wasn't like a monetary thing, you know, incentive and not that that's, there's anything wrong with that, but um, it, it just sort of evolved to the way I think it should, should evolve mm -hmm. to. <laughs> Well, and when it grows organically like that, you know that it resonates with it resonates you. exactly because it wouldn't grow if it didn't, uh, if, if it wasn't, you know, important for people. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. Well, when we created the mint door, yeah, um, yeah. we had to think very carefully about the color that we wanted our door to be. Okay. Uh, so if you had to pick a color oh. to paint your door. <laughs> what would it be and why well, I do like mint a lot but that would be like copying <laughs> <laughs> I mean color to pick I think the magenta kind of clearly resonates with me I think it's powerful I think it's sexy I think it's you know bold and elegant so that's and that's that tends to be the theme for our events like uh, you know there's just a, a flavor of elegance um class uh, sophistication, clean type of look. So I would say magenta. Mm -hmm. And there was a store in Toronto called, well, in Canada, Holt Renfrew. And I remember just, you know, back then, you know, we didn't have any other American department stores. But if you thought, you know, where do you go and shop for classy, like high end stuff? It was Holt's. And they had a beautiful magenta bag. And I thought, I like that. So, <laughs> so that would be my color. It is a, I love that color. It's cool. Um, a couple of weeks ago. The dress color that I bought to the symposium. Like, yeah. I have to buy that dress because it's the right color. It's amazing. And a couple of weeks ago, Laura and I, we were part of a fashion show uh -huh. for Twice As Nice Uniforms. Okay. And a lady called Deborah Carrier that has that, has that company. And she, she asked me to wear a dental jacket in that color. Love it. And it was absolutely I loved it so much. And so many people said that is an amazing color. I have a, I have a big uh, uh, scrub like this, but yeah. we have to get black in our office. So I, I sometimes yeah. break out and wear it, but it's, yeah, it's really the pop of color with you. Exactly. <laughs> so I, at least I have my lanyard that, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it is a beautiful color in that. And it, it really does highlight, I think, very many different, skin so. skin tones and yeah. hair colors it's a beautiful I color never really thought it, again it was just like I like that color why don't we just go with it but then when I when you know in retrospect looking back I'm like I like it I like the tone of it I like that it's powerful and sexy and you know bold and all those good things so yeah it's a good well, color if you, ever, if you ever see um a suit like a jacket yeah and pants in that color let me know because that is what that's on my shopping list that's awesome I think Zara <laughs> has some stuff like that because jewel tones are very in these days yeah. so <laughs> that's what I'm looking for Yay. 
Yeah. Awesome. All right. So looking back at your life, we're, we're curious if there is one event that you didn't expect that um, changed your life for the better. Oh my gosh. One event that I didn't expect that changed my life for the better. I think if I keep my professional hat on, I would say cornering Dr. Zarb at that elevator mm -hmm. because that that was on the heels of a disappointment. The backstory was is that there was a um, a formal University of Toronto match program for for students to match with other profs. And I thought I had it in the bag. Like I thought, oh yeah, I got the job with such and such and I didn't get it. I'm like, oh. I didn't get, you know, anyone going into dental school or medical school, we're all such high achievers and we achieved everything. I think that was my first like disappointment in life. And I'm like, oh my God. But then, wow, I'm so glad I didn't get that because otherwise I wouldn't have been hungry to, to, mm -hmm. to corner Dr. Zarb. And I'm so glad I did because I think my life would have been totally different mm -hmm. and being, you know, surrounded by such great mentors in, in, that department and you know mm -hmm. later on I, I'm working here be at, at prosthodontic associates because my instructor in prosthodontics was Dr. Barsley who was another mentor and he hired me as soon as I graduated from school so I think that that fortuitous moment you know cornering Dr. Zarb at the elevator was probably a, a very uh, a very positive thing for me. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that backstory because I think that that you know we we often talk about those highlight reels, but oh, yeah. um, we all Not have the all that... insides, right? <laughs> and I, I mean, I my biggest 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 accomplishment in my life, and the thing that I'm most proud of is my kids. Mm -hmm. And I have four kids: uh, Eden, Aaron, Jacob, and Liam. And um, I try to instill that in them. And we can talk for hours about kids and the guilt that comes into that. But that, that's another podcast. Um, but, you know, where was I going with that? That's my biggest accomplishment. But yeah, I tell them any disappointment or any failure, don't worry about it. It'll it'll all kind of something good will come out of that. And that, that's what they say. I mean, we've all, all heard it before, you know, with every disappointment, every cloud has a silver lining and definitely getting not getting that job as a summer student with that said professor was the best thing that could have happened mm -hmm. for me because I don't think I'd be sitting here today if it was for that so uh -huh. you know if if you fall down just wipe yourself up and get back up because it's uh mm -hmm. you know I think the sky's the limit I was raised in a family with two other sisters where you know my dad said like we can do anything we my parents said we can do anything we wanted to and and we did achieve me as a dentist my other sister as a as an accountant and a, and a lawyer. So, you know, we can do anything that men can do. So it's, it's all, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> so are your children all boys? No, I have a girl and three boys and my daughter just got, so she's 21. She just got into medical school. Um, yeah. So really proud of her. And the boys are, are also amazing in their own right. They're in, the twins are in university and my youngest is in high school. So it's uh they're, they're a fun crew. They're a very good, good, group of kids um, yeah. group of <laughs> thank you yeah well you you mentioned about how you know people in this industry are high achievers and we get so caught up in pursuing goals and achieving and checking things off our list that yeah. it's easy to forget the little things that bring you joy and you mentioned yeah. your family and how important they are but mm -hmm. I'm curious or we're curious what would be one small thing that brings you joy small thing that brings me joy I mean a big thing is just spending time with the kids like I just love I love to travel and I think that's part of my appeal with um whether it's work or or pleasure um just getting on a plane and just you know I actually had one when you reach a certain air mile status you have some perks or some some benefits that you can choose from and one of the choices was to get free Wi-Fi for the year, which is a pretty decent uh, savings. And I looked at it, I said, no, <laughs> I don't want to be connected. <laughs> uh, no, no, thank you. I'm just going to unplug and, you know, load my iPad with movies or with books or whatever. And mm -hmm. so to me, like just traveling, whether it's of course with my family or, or my children or, or on my own to see the world and to meet people is just, uh, I think that I derive a lot of joy from that for sure. With no Wi-Fi. With no Wi-Fi. <laughs> Limited Wi-Fi. If I absolutely want to check something, I'll, I'll 
buy an hour's worth of Wi-Fi, but no, I didn't get that. And that was a conscious decision. I'm like, mm, no, <laughs> I'm not going to take it. So I'm with you on that one, the travel and yeah. also the movies on planes. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I can't somehow, I'm not very good at working on planes. So I always watch a movie and they're oh, like, it's just so nice mm-hmm. to just mm-hmm. chill and not be bothered by the phone ding, 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 you know? So it's just like, it's good. I like that. <laughs> yeah. A conscious decision to put yeah. work life balance into play in the moments where we can, Two right? Hours, if we can, exactly. Yeah. And to play, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, this has been an absolute joy and we appreciate all that you do and all that you and are. Right back at you, both of you. Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And we just want to highlight that um, you can find out more about women in dentistry, both at the website, which is just womenindentistry.com. No, sorry, it's actually, that name was taken. So it's womensdentistry.com. Thank <laughs> womensdentistry.com. you. Womensdentistry.com. Yes. Thank you. And uh, we do have the CA, the dot CA. Uh, I have to link that. That's another thing I need to do. So, but yeah, womensdentistry.com and maybe we can have it in the caption or something. And then Instagram, same thing at women's dentistry. So, yes, yes. We will make sure those links are correct down below. So those yeah. will get there. And then you have your own Instagram account too. So if oh, people yeah. wanted to reach out to you, yeah. you can. At F.A. Hapsha, it's pretty easy. <laughs> there you go. Excellent. That's so. Pleasure. Wonderful. We'll make sure and get all those links, but we are looking forward to coming to the symposium in Toronto in April and um, and mentoring and uh, doing all the wonderful things for women in dentistry. Thanks for, you know, bringing this to light and bringing women together. It's fantastic. Thank you. It's my absolute joy and pleasure. Thank you so much, ladies. Yeah, thank You're you. Welcome. All right, we will wrap it up for today and see you on the next episode of the Mint Door Podcast. We'll be back.